So firstly then, on the question of the austerity agenda, um, it's become something of a, of, a, of, a, of a term that has been coined now. People are using the term austerity that uh, perhaps they hadn't even heard it a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, since 2008, since the financial difficulties and world crisis that emerged at that time, uh, austerity has been uh, austerity has been trumpeted. The need for austerity has been trump uh, trumpeted. Um, those uh, members of the federal cabinet that come out of the uh, the experience of being uh, of being conservative members of uh, of the Mike Harris cabinet in Ontario are particularly enthusiastic about the notion of imposing uh, of imposing austerity. Um, but uh, but everywhere we hear reference to it. The uh, the International Monetary Fund, no less, has proposed 20 years of austerity as a as a uh, as a solution to the uh, to the difficulties that the system has run into, um, and it does indeed come out of a uh, it does indeed come out of a crisis that emerged in 2008, and we will cast our mind back to the uh, to uh, to when the financial markets stood on the abyss and long-standing and powerful financial institutions <coughs> were either failing or being bailed out, and then that spread to the uh, that spread to the, the productive arm of capital, and the same process found itself underway with auto companies needing, uh, needing rescues, etc. But that crisis has developed historically in certain ways. And if we're going to talk about uh, examining and if we're going to talk about researching that agenda, I think we should, we, should, uh, we should set the stage a little bit in terms of how it emerged. And to do that, I think we have to go back to uh, the period immediately following the, uh, the Second World War, uh, when there had been a great international conflict uh, and in the wake of that conflict, uh, there was a real upsurge throughout the world of movements of resistance and struggle. Um, the, uh, in the oppressed countries of the earth, national liberation movements challenged colonialism. Uh, many great uh, battles were fought that, uh, that emerged victorious. Um, and then uh, in, the, uh, in, in countries like Canada, historically privileged countries, um, we saw an upsurge of trade union organizing. Uh, and a very powerful upsurge it was. Uh, there were pivotal battles fought at that time. Uh, very defiant, very militant, very powerful struggles that led to significant victories. Uh, in uh, Windsor in 1945, the workers achieved the dues check off for Canadian workers in recognition of unions and won their own victory by forming a powerful uh, blockade of vehicles around the, around the plant to, uh, to force the, uh, the company to negotiate. And the Attorney General uh, of Ontario said that uh, insurrection was broken out in the city of Windsor. Uh, a slight exaggeration, but it still was pretty powerful. Um, and uh, that process was continued, and, and major victories and major gains were won. Now, the result of that, and I mentioned the dues check off, it was part of the process, uh, what emerged was what has sometimes been referred to as the post-war settlement. There was uh, an unspoken but a very palpable agreement that was reached uh, in which um, unions were recognized, where uh, not that long before Canadian law had treated the act of collective bargaining as criminal conspiracy, unions were recognized uh, and, uh, and uh, were able to bargain effectively, were able to make very definite gains, were able to extend their base, were able to organize new sections of workers. And uh, as well, uh, what is sometimes referred to as the social wage, the social programs, were definitely strengthened. Uh, systems of unemployment insurance, systems of social assistance, Medicare, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of programs were, uh, were put into place and were incrementally strengthened. And that process continued up until, let us say, the late 1970s, <coughs> when the post-war boom definitively came to an end. Um, but there was a reverse side of that deal. Uh, and the deal was essentially this, is that the, struggle, uh, the struggles of unions and other struggles would be contained. They would be contained within certain boundaries. Uh, workers would not launch general strikes. Workers would fight. If they, if they went on strike, they would strike around their own individual contract issues. The, uh, the political strike, such as emerged in Winnipeg, uh, for example, would not be, uh, would not be a feature of, uh, of Canadian life. And uh, 
there was a, a deal whereby incremental gains would be paid for in the form of an acceptance of the existing order and a readiness to, uh, and a readiness to uh, avoid uh, uh, mobilization on the basis of what we might call maximum disruption. Um, and, that was, uh, and that process continued. Um, and unfortunately, one side of it has continued up until this day. Because what happened was, it, at the end of the 1970s, uh, a new uh, agenda began to emerge, um, began to emerge uh, in, amongst those with economic and political power. Uh, the gains that people had won began to cut into profits. There was uh, a crisis of declining, uh, of a declining rate of profit that emerged within the uh, within the world system of capitalism at that uh, at that time. And so a new agenda of neoliberalism was put into what was put into effect, and uh, theoreticians of that uh, of that uh, procedure uh, rejected the ideas of Keynesianism and deficit financing and looked to remove barriers to profit. And uh, uh, one of the the leading uh, edges ideologically of that was the Chicago School of, uh, of Economics that uh, that advanced these uh, these ideas with considerable. Uh, with considerable enthusiasm, um, they of course were had a very serendipitous development uh, in the uh, in the form of the uh, brutal military coup in Chile in the 1970s, and they were able to act as economic advisors to uh, to uh, an experiment with neoliberalism that uh, that had the, uh, the fortunate uh, capacity to send dissidents to torture chambers, uh, and. Uh, they were able to uh, to learn a lot from those experiences, and they they looked as well at questions of uh, of how neoliberalism could advance in uh, in in more uh, in more restrained circumstances where they didn't have uh, a direct police state to uh, to work with, and uh, they looked at, uh, for example, one of their papers dealt with the question of unemployment insurance and welfare in the United States of America, and uh, in 1974 a couple of them. Uh, wrote a uh, paper in which they looked at the question of why it was that at, in 1974 uh, unemployment was at record levels in the, in the, uh, since the Great Depression, and yet, and yet, uh, and yet wages were not coming down. And the conclusion they came to was that, as they put it, unemployment insurance and welfare programs had made unemployment insufficiently terrifying. Uh, which says a lot about why Mike Harris did what he did in 1995 with the, uh, with the, cut, to, uh, with the cut to social assistance rates.